Today on the Luke Loses Podcast, Between the Before and After with John McLernan, I talk to John, a podcast host, an expert emotional eating coach who has lost and kept off over 100 pounds. I hope you enjoy it. What's up, losers? I am Luke, and this is Luke Loses. We're losing the weight, we're losing the unhealthy lifestyle, and we're losing that negative image we have for ourselves. Please remember that I have no fitness or nutrition education. Everything I talk about is from asking questions, searching the internet, and my own personal experiences. Check out my website. It is www.lukeloosespodcast.com. That's got my social media links as well as other locations where you can listen to this podcast. You can also call the loser line, which is 323-920-LUKE or 5853. You can leave me a voicemail or send me a text. Leave me tips, topic ideas, concerns, whatever's on your mind. I look forward to hearing from you. Also, if you don't follow me on Instagram, please do that. It is at the Luke Loses Podcast. All right. With that being said, let's jump right into today's episode. What's going on, everybody? Thank you so much for checking out the Luke Loses Podcast. If you are new, welcome. If you are not new, welcome back. I just want to say how much I appreciate every one of you. If you didn't listen to my last episode, it was released two weeks ago. I missed last week. I decided to take the time off. It is called Show Up Daily with Michael and Broken. It is an amazing story. I talk with Michael and his... I just, I can't explain the story, how crazy it is. I'll give you a little taste. Uh, When he was four years old, his mother actually cut off one of his fingers. He grew up poor. He went on to make over $100,000 a year, morbidly obese, drug addiction, alcoholism, and he completely changed his life around. So if you missed that, check it out. It is a great conversation. As for today's episode, I talked to John McLernan. It is is a great conversation and he and I just I don't know we we had a really good talk we we clicked we we worked really well together just just having a a conversation uh John hosts a podcast called wellness unplugged I will link that in the description of this episode check it out I've listened to a couple of his episodes it's really informative also with this interview I believe my microphone wasn't turned on so the quality isn't the best and my internet, I was having trouble with that. So there might be a couple times where he's a little fuzzy, but I cl- tried to clean it up as best as I could. So with that being said, let's just hop right into the interview. So today on the show, I have Jonathan McLernan. He is an expert emotional eating coach. He's lost and kept off a hundred pounds. He's passionate about behavioral psychology and brain driven weight loss. Jonathan, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey, man. Thank you so much. Um, Well, I've had a pretty varied background um, and there's a lot of failure in my background. (laughs) People would look at my resume and wonder like, why did so many things? Like I was a former nanotechnology researcher at University of Victoria. Um, I was a marine engineer in the Navy for six years. Uh, I'm a four-time entrepreneur with two failed businesses and I've been a a globetrotting English teacher. And when I started struggling with my own weight, I went from being an athlete to being obese. I had a whole new perspective and a whole new understanding of what it's actually like to struggle with this stuff. And I wasted like a lot of time and energy on stuff that really didn't work. And something strange, I don't know if it's strange. I started to really hate myself. (laughs) I got so frustrated that my body wouldn't do what I wanted it to do or what I was trying to force it to do that uh, it was like I was trying to punish it into submission. And a real shift happened for me about four years ago when I started working with a coach and he started talking to me about self-compassion And that was such a foreign language for me. Like what's self-compassion? What's that for? You know, is that for weak people or something? (laughs) But to get into that, you know, and and realize that, oh my gosh, like I can actually care for myself and lose weight and I don't have to beat myself up. And so that was this huge, huge um, shift. And it really shifted how I work with people when it comes to coaching them, because I recognized that this wasn't an issue of just like discipline or laziness. There's usually... In fact, there's almost always more to the picture. And really it it opened me up to being a lot more compassionate towards other people. So you you mentioned like the, the, the self-compassion. I had a guest on 
recently and she brought up self-forgiveness and like i got so much anxiety just thinking about that because there's so much that i need to apologize to myself and forgive myself and it's just like it was like wow it's it's insane how much work goes into this that's not just work yeah i think you know why is especially for men like self-compassion so hard and I find myself asking the question, you know, if we treated a friend the way that we treat ourselves or, or a loved one, yeah. like, would we have a friendship or a relationship, you know? Yeah. I thought about that the other day. I seen a post on Facebook. A friend of mine said, uh, if you treated somebody you cared about how you treat yourself, would you still be friends with that person? Or if somebody treated you the way that you treat yourself? And I was like, no, I, I wouldn't have any friends if, if for the most part, yeah. like, cause yeah. I mean, the, for me, the, the body image issue and like just the, the self hate, like one, one thing that constantly pops in my head is, you know, seven years ago, if I would have stuck to the gym the first time, you know, I was, I was down like 130 pounds and my arms are huge. My chest was huge. I was, you know, I I was starting to get abs, but I quit and where could I have been if I would have just continued. But you know, this time around with, with working on myself entirely, it's, it's making a lot more sense and it's easier to start to uh, actually like who I am and who I'm going to become. You know, um, and what, I mean, it's crazy to think you lost 130 pounds, but I think this is actually really powerful because it highlights something that we miss. It was like an outside in approach and you took care of the outside, but the inside wasn't addressed. Yeah. And the way that our brain works, and this is why I focus on what I call brain-driven weight loss, the way that brain works, like it pulls us back into, like, could we say that you were not acting in congruence with your sense of identity? In other words, your internal environment hadn't really fully shifted. And you might look back and maybe there wasn't really a trigger event, maybe there was, but maybe it was just a slow spiral where you miss miss the gym here or there and bit by bit, piece by piece, it kind of just gets or starts to feel more and more difficult. Maybe discouragement sets in. What's yeah. the point? The emotional eating sets in and so on. And so it really, but your story isn't done. That's the best part of it, you know? Yeah. And uh, you being willing to open up and be vulnerable and share this is like, I think really, really like, just open up your journey and say, this is the human struggle. Like, this is what it's like to actually try and do it. So, you know, I, I genuinely commend you for that. And the fact that you are continuing to go on this journey instead of just giving up altogether um, is a real testament to your strength of character. I appreciate that. I, uh, I I actually thought about that the other day. I was doing an episode and it was uh, a solo episode and it was kind of a rant and it sounded really miserable. And I took a second and I was like, just so everybody's aware, like, I know this may sound sad, but this is my journey. This is where I'm going and it's not over, you know? So, um, I have got to that where it's like, man, this is, this is kind of sad, you know, but as long as I'm still trying, I, I'm going to, I'm going to keep, keep it up, you know? And there's, there's another piece here that, um, you need to talk about the lost years. If we put it that way, if only I'd kept going, but give yourself space to feel it and be like, you know what? It sucks. It sucks that that, that happened. It's, I, I feel like sometimes we're afraid to sort of just feel that hard, oh, the sting of that. And I'm like, you know what? Don't feel it to punish yourself, but just feel it to be yeah. human. Okay. And and you can let that, you can let it fuel you. I don't want to feel that sting again. And it has nothing to do with like your self-worth, but just that can become a place of motivation. But I just kind of think we, we in general, we kind of suck at grieving <laughs> things that yeah. we lose. And th- that was a missed opportunity you know? And so it's okay to give space to grief, if I could put it that way. That even goes back to that forgiveness and and the compassion and all that, like uh, just thinking about it. But I I do want to ask you about your weight loss, right? So you're down a hundred pounds and you've kept that Mm -hmm. off. How how long have you, have you uh, kept that off? A little over two years now. That's awesome. What what did you, uh, what did you do to lose it? Because I I know I have seen you talk about being a binge eater and a food addict similar to myself. So, uh, that's, that's why I'm asking is, you know, how did you get around that? What did you do? Yeah. And I love that question because I think the answer we're looking for is, oh, you know, I ate this particular, you know, I went paleo and took up CrossFit 
<laughs> or something like that. And the maybe less satisfying, but really more powerful answer is I started to work on myself. Um, I, I started, to, because as I started to work on myself and I started to process, you know, grief and trauma and these emotions that I talk about, I started turning less to food to deal with being uncomfortable. Um, so I, I started doing things like taking a cold shower. Um, and uh, I'm actually thinking about putting together, here I am just randomly riffing, but I'm thinking about putting together what I call like a 30-day resilience challenge. And it's about 30 days of doing something uncomfortable every day where we're willing, because what I would do is I would use food whenever I felt an uncomfortable emotion to quickly yeah. try to erase it and push it away. So one of the things I did is I would just turn the shower as cold as it could go and just step in and just take a deep breath and breathe out and go, I'm going to be okay. So I started to, in a sense, teach myself to be okay with being uncomfortable because it's not like a cold shower is comfortable. Yeah. I'm okay in discomfort. And that can translate to I'm okay if I feel hunger. I'm okay if I feel an urge or a craving. I don't have to answer it. And so that's like a much like, in a sense, it's a deeper work than, you know, obviously I did think, you know, there's, there's some of the basics, hydration, activity, eat some vegetables, get yeah. some protein, that kind of stuff. But really to make it stick... Because I did a lot of diets over the, you know, it took me six years. I did a lot of diets and none of them stuck because I didn't do this internal work. And so that's kind of what I'm shining a light on when I work with people is we got to be willing to do the hard stuff instead of trying to uh, steer around it. And that's what allows us to create permanent transformation. That's always been my, my thing is every time I try to lose weight, it's, uh, you know, I've said it tons of times, eat less, move more, you'll lose weight. Well, it's yeah. now what? You know, that, that was my yeah. problem is I would always quit and be like, well, I'm good now. Let's go to that all you can eat buffet and smash yeah. four days a week. <laughs> yeah, that's real though, man. Um, and that has to do with this sort of kind of our sense of identity. It seems like, like, okay, logically it doesn't make sense that we would sabotage ourselves, but self-sabotage doesn't come from a logical part of our brain. So it's like the logical part of our brain is called the prefrontal cortex. That's kind of like the forehead. That's actually where the front of your brain is. You know, that's where we, we sort of calculate the risks of our good and bad behaviors. Should I do this? What will happen? And so on. Now, the more tired we get, the less we turn to that part of our brain because it, it you know, it, it's just more calculation intensive, if I can put it that way. The primal part of our brain, which is really driven from like emotions and a subconscious sense of identity doesn't do a whole lot of that. It's just like, bing, I feel uncomfortable. I eat something like no calculation required. Yeah. And we also, maybe I could, I'll, I'll use an example. Do you have a, like a vice or a trigger food or, or something that you struggle to, to regulate? You know, if you start eating it, you'll have a hard time stopping. Yeah. So for me, it, it starts with peanut butter. Like I just oh, get in that yeah. jar and then it goes from peanut butter to a can or two of raviolis. I don't know why those go together for me. And then yeah. it's game Peanut, peanut butter is your gateway drug, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, and so uh, I used to not keep Kraft peanut butter in the house. Whether you know, It could be like Kraft, it could be Jif, could be Skippy, whatever. It's basically like peanut butter icing. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, but I, So I used to call the Kraft peanut butter crack peanut butter. And uh, so I just asked my wife not to bring those Costco sized jars into the house because I really struggled to regulate my consumption of peanut butter. And I call it like not running on a sprained ankle. It's, you know, now we can keep it in the house because I don't, I don't binge, binge on peanut butter. But back then in all of my struggles, I'd put like an inch layer of peanut butter or I'd make like a, a five layer sandwich, <laughs> you know, peanut butter, bread, <laughs> peanut butter, bread, throw some butter in there for a little extra creaminess, yep. you know, and just make this big old mashed sandwich of and so if we if we kind of look at it this way so if we look at a propeller um uh, think of a three-bladed propeller and at the the center of that propeller the hub is peanut butter and and each blade represents like a, a loop we'll call it so the first loop goes uh, i feel uncomfortable i eat peanut butter i feel better the first time you do that your brain goes bingo i learned something when I eat peanut butter, I feel better. So now it takes that solution and anytime you feel uncomfortable, it goes, do you want to eat some peanut butter? <laughs> now, 
peanut butter leads to uh, eating, you know, canned ravioli and so on. So then, then the byproduct of that is gaining weight. So now we're going to move over to the second piece. And you go, okay, peanut butter is clearly the problem. It's the gateway drug. So we're, we're swearing off peanut butter. No more peanut butter. It's not coming in the house, yada, yada, yada. So then your brain goes, hey, Luke, I want some peanut butter. <laughs> and you go, you know, so the cravings start until mm-hmm. eventually your brain is like, Luke, damn it, give me peanut butter. And it gets so loud that you can't ignore it. So now you eat peanut butter and bingo, you're right back in the first loop. I felt uncomfortable. I ate peanut butter. I felt better. So now we've reinforced that kind of habit loop. So the first loop is the habit loop. The second one is, I call it like the craving loop. So once we reinforce it, the third one is the identity loop. Sorry, identity loop, I should clarify. And that is, so now you say, I'm addicted to peanut butter. For me, I call it crack, you know. Your brain goes, okay, if you're addicted to peanut butter, what happens when you see peanut butter? Well, you eat it. So eating peanut butter out of control is in alignment with your sense of identity. I'm addicted to peanut butter. So it becomes all three of these kind of together become this sort of self-reinforcing loop that keeps you trapped in this cycle of behavior. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. And so while, while we were talking about this, I was thinking how crazy this must sound to somebody who doesn't have these issues with food. Yeah. I seen you post something about the pizza recently where you, yeah. you ate a slice of pizza and you were like to, to normal people, because I say normal people all the time, end quote. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. To, a, to a normal person, that sounds, okay, well, you ate a piece of pizza, but I can't imagine how crazy we sound to somebody who doesn't have these food issues. Yeah. Uh, you know, I ate um, two pieces of pizza with a fork and knife and other people at the table, I think it was driving them a little bit nuts. I was... But I think now if I eat fast, because I used to eat like a, you know, like I say a seagull swallowing a tennis ball, you know, yeah. just shoveling as fast as I could go. And my wife used to put her arm on my shoulder and be like, you know, you can slow down. And it used to make me so angry because she was shining a light on. I was eating like a starving, I was just inhaling food. So now for me to slow down and eat with a fork and knife and like savor every bite i squeeze like the maximum amount of enjoyment out of two slices of pizza yeah and so because i'm not feeling guilty about eating it anymore i don't have the shame connected to eating it and so now i genuinely give myself permission to enjoy it if i'm going to eat pizza yeah talking about going slow eating slower i actually had a guest who recommended uh uh, chopsticks so (laughs) i've been eating with chopsticks on occasion because that's the yeah. same thing with me. Like my wife's like, we just need to get you a trough, you know, because like I just shovel yeah. it in, you know? So I don't know if this is uh, etiquette, proper etiquette or not, but I know you are a binge eater and yeah. a food addict. How long has it been since you binged? I don't, you don't have to answer that. I don't know if that's. No, to, I'm, I'm pretty open, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's probably been, I'd say probably my last binge would have been in 2018. So a little more than three years ago. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and we, we can, we can share a little bit about binge eating if it's helpful, right? Like, um, what would I say? Binge eating is like, it's a genuine eating disorder. Um, it's like episodes of uncontrolled eating in a really short window of time. And usually it's going to be like a repeated pattern of behavior. So I would have at least one binge a week, usually more than that. And once that pattern, you know, once that pattern is kind of established, you could say, you know, you, you have a binge eating disorder and there, there is a difference though, between say like binge eating, emotional eating and overeating. Now, some overeating can be binge eating, some emotional eating can be binge eating, but they're all kind of separate, right? Binge eating kind of falls on more extreme end. Um, if it's helpful, I can say like, maybe we could even identify like, what are some causes? Because if anyone out there feels like, man, I'm just, you know, I'm struggling with this idea of binge eating. Uh, genetics, that can actually play a role, like family history. Um, depression, although it's not like it's not entirely an established sort of cause and effect. Uh, low self-esteem, stress, anxiety, or things like trying to rigidly adhere, like rigidly adhere to um, food rules. So, for me, I think it was 
I call it like trying to change the channel in my head. And I would do it in secret. So I would, and I pick on pizza because it was like my comfort food. You know, pizza is like the perfect comfort food. It's warm. It's filling. Like it just makes you feel full on the inside, you know? And uh, so I would eat like, I'd buy like an entire pizza and eat it in my car in a parking lot. And then I'd go home and eat like a few mouthfuls at dinner and be like, oh my gosh, I'm so full. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know? So it's that eating in secret as well and eating and feeling a lot of shame around eating. Um, So... Then we could say, okay, well, how did I start to work around it? Um, and maybe the first recognition is, like, don't beat yourself up because if that was going to work, it would it would have like worked already. Um, working with a coach, like we we kind of kept a food diary, and it's not necessarily about exactly what you eat, but there's more to it. Like, um, how did I feel when I ate? Because yeah. uh, a binge is never it's never like a random event. You know, you think, oh my gosh, it just came out of the blue. And it's like, no, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> there's, yeah. if, if we, if we actually scratch on the surface, we'll figure, oh, there's a couple of things that happened under the surface that led to that. Right. Yeah. And so I will say like, um, compassionate awareness is really a powerful step towards change. And I, I deliberately put the word compassion in there because awareness might be like your wife telling you, we need to get you a trough. Yeah. That's not a very compassionate awareness. <laughs> yeah. That's just an uncomfortable light being shone on you that makes you want to eat even more to sort of bury that discomfort. Exactly. I I usually say, you know, food gets me. Food understands me. You know, like food's never told me stuff like that. So oh, I'm going to eat it and it's going to do what I think it's supposed to do. And that's make me feel better and yeah. forget the problems. Man, I'm just, I'm like literally writing that down because I'm like, <laughs> I feel that one to my core. Yeah. <laughs> food gets me. You know, and that, that actually is really interesting because that's, that's kind of telling or revealing in a sense, right? Food is providing you a sense of comfort that you're not finding somewhere else and it's providing it without judgment. So when I go to work with somebody, like, I think it's really important this idea of, com- like I said, compassion. Now, compassion is not a get out of jail free card. And I think we need to hi- highlight that too, because there's this temptation to go, Oh, you've had a hard day. You might as well just like, go ahead and keep eating. Yeah. That's called enabling. (laughs) That's not helping you move forward. But it's really, I would say, it's not using your struggles as like ammunition against you. Not saying, you know, you should be in the pig barn the way you're eating. Yeah. It's, it's like, hey, like, what's going on, man? Like, like, where are you at? And, and, and then just hearing without judgment that's a really hard thing to do, especially because the other thing we do is we take how we feel about ourselves and then we project it onto somebody else and assume they must feel the same way about us. Yeah. You're talking to a mirror, man. I, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm everything we're talking about is like exactly how I feel, how I felt thoughts that have crossed my mind. Yeah. Projections a big yeah, one man. for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you, you know, when you, you shared some things and like, man, that is spot on when you said food gets me. That's why I wrote that down. I was like, dang, I feel that one. You know, um, a couple other things that I did, um, I call it like putting stop signs into my snacking. So let's say if we go to Costco and get like a big old bag of chips, which you don't really do anymore. But if we were to do that in a moment where I felt like I was in control of my emotions, I would take it and I would divide it into like little Ziploc bags and then kind of put them back in the bag so that I could just grab a portion and I would take it away. And at the end of eating that, there's a natural pause because I've reached the end of the container. In this case, a small Ziploc bag instead of a giant Costco bag. Now there's a pause where I have to stop and think, do I want more? And sometimes the answer is yes, I would go back for more. But sometimes the answer is no, I don't actually want to get off my butt, walk all the way back to the pantry and get another (laughs) bag. I'm good. And so the other thing is maybe... You know, I give the example of this bag of peanut M and M's that my wife bought. You know, it's like this four pound or five pound bag. This stew, like, why does Costco even make them? Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> and I would bury it in the bottom of the pantry. So I'd have to move like the pickle jar and the bag of flour to get to it. And so I knew it was there, but if I wanted to get to it, I had to kind of get down on my hands and knees and move this bag of flour and jar of pickles to get to it. And uh, so then I'd think about it, be like, mm, man, I really want some peanut M and M's. I'm like, ah, do I feel like you know, so just putting little impediments that make me need to stop and think before I 
before I act. Versus say, if you put the big old bag of peanut M&Ms on the counter, every time you walk past it, you're, it's going to be like, bing, I want to eat. Yeah. So it's like, it's shaping my environment, recognizing like there's some certain instincts and impulses and urges I have that they're not going away. And so I need to make my environment more supportive of that fact. With you being a binge eater and with your knowledge of emotional eating, um, on my end, right? So I do the emotional eating when I'm sad, I eat when I'm happy, I eat, you know, so on and so forth. And I yeah. overeat um, with me, with my binging, it was like an everyday thing. And it was like, I don't really crave food. I crave binge eating. I crave like that uncomfortable feeling. I want to know yeah. what your thoughts on that is. Well, and I guess I can only maybe share from my own personal experience, but I, I think I know what you're saying. Um, it was like trying to fill an emptiness. And so I would eat to being like uncomfortably full. So there was no, no space left in my stomach, basically. Yeah. So you're right. It wasn't even like, yes, maybe peanut butter was one of my triggers. Pizza might have been another one, but. I mean, I could have binge ate like a bag of corn chips and salsa. Yeah. Um, so it's, it was wanting that sense of fullness. Here's an interesting thing that kind of broke it for me. I started having um, anxiety episodes in about 2016. I would start to have panic attacks when I got too full, feeling like I couldn't breathe. <laughs> wow. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't normally say that anxiety is kind of a blessing in disguise, but really in this case it was. And I wouldn't go, I wouldn't say that's the best way to kind of break binge eating, but it became this, you know, what am I more willing to tolerate? A panic attack or stopping the binge like midway through? Yeah. And uh, I didn't want to use a medication for anxiety. And so it's it's like that that phrase that says something like, we don't change until like the pain of remaining the same is worse than the pain of making the change. Yeah. And so the pain of a panic attack when I was overstuffed, because the thing is, okay, let's just say I ate an entire pizza. Unless I was just going to start throwing it up and becoming a bulimic, it would mean I had to sit with that uncomfortable feeling of fullness for like hours and I couldn't sleep because it was hard to breathe. You try to lay down after your stomach is so full and mm -hmm. Can't get comfortable. You know, yeah. And so th th I think it was that discomfort that made me go, okay, I have to, like, we have to approach this a little bit differently. That and, like, changing my relationship with myself. So I stopped, like, because sometimes I would spite eat. <laughs> like, I'd be so angry at my body for not, for not losing the weight when I wanted it to. And I would eat to be like, fine. F you. Yeah. <laughs> if you're uh, if you're not gonna lose weight, I'm gonna stuff you. So F you, body. Might as uh, well. If I'm not losing any weight, might as well eat what I want instead of, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean I used to say if it's if it's going to waste, it might as well be my waste. <laughs> yeah. That's spot on, man. Um yeah. you mentioned anxiety and I this is I, I, I cope with humor, right? The funny fat guy. Yeah. I've talked about this before. Oh man, um, the jolly fat guy. Well, today I got an email. So I'm a, I'm big on therapy. I always yep. say, if you don't go to therapy, if you don't think you need it, go, it's, it'll help. Well, I got an email today. So I, I see my therapist about my anxiety issues and stuff. And today I got an email saying that my therapist is no longer working with the company. So like I got anxiety about not being able to see my anxiety therapist. I, I think that was funny and I wanted to t touch on that. So it's interesting f hearing these parallels. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I also say like, man, we should normalize therapy. Um, I did an episode with another guy who's like, uh, what do you call it? Like a brain trainer. I don't, um, and he, he was talking about you know, when you get a shoulder injury, you probably actually take a break from the gym. Um, we normally go to the gym to, 
to improve our health. Well, why don't we go to a therapist to like strengthen our mental health rather than waiting until basically things break? Yeah. And so I wish we could normalize um, going to therapy that it's not actually a sign of weakness. It's it's like going to the gym to train your muscles, except oh, yeah. you're going to str- strengthen your brain. Yeah, I've I've talked about how I can I can talk to any one of my friends or my family about my issues, but it's never made more sense when when I until I was talking to my my therapist about it. You know, like issues with my wife. My wife and I we do couples as well. And yeah. um, then I go on my own and it's, it's amazing how much, how, how our relationship has grown together, just learning on how to approach things. So I'm, I'm huge on it. I recommend it. I, I make a little joke um, saying that I never, I never needed therapy until COVID closed down the barber shops. Once my barber closed, I was like, I need to talk to somebody because my barber, yeah. he knew all my issues. Man, even even having a podcast can be like a, a type of therapy, really. Oh yeah, yeah. I just hit yeah. record and go. My wife has seen like all of my ups and downs. She's been yeah. by my side through all of it, and we've we've had to grow together. And you know, there were times that I was so low on myself that I was like, "You should just go back to Australia." My wife's from Australia. I live in Canada. For those who don't know, um, I was like, "You should just go home to Australia. Like you you deserve better than me. Just just leave." But oh, yeah. she wouldn't. That was me projecting my my sense of worthlessness onto her. And she's like, no, I see who you are. I'm not leaving you. Yeah, same same story, man. I don't know how many times I told my wife stuff like that. Um, Shout out to your wife, man. <laughs> with my, my anxiety, right? So we'll go out Well, before all this. We'd go out to the bar. She'd be like, well, let's go dance. And I'd be like, my, in my mind, I'm like, I'm the fattest person here. And you're one of the hottest. It's not going to look good for you. So I'd be like, go dance with my buddy or go, you know, watch that guy's hands, but go dance with him, you know? And uh, she's like, well, I want to dance with you. But I'm like, well, I'm embarrassed for you. All these people see it. And it's, it's all in my head. Nobody ever said those kind of things to me. It was just the up in, in my old noggin. Yeah. How many years have you been together with your wife? Oh, we've been together. Oh man. Hopefully she doesn't listen. Uh, I think we've been together eight and a half years. We've been married for almost two. So it took us a while to get awesome. married. But, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's awesome, man. Uh, what's your wife's name? Uh, Cheyenne. And it's, it's spelled pretty cool. It's spelled C H I A N N E. So it's not your typical okay. Cheyenne. It's pretty cool. Uh, for some reason, my, my guess was going to be Charlotte. <laughs> so I was actually not too far off. No, no, no. <laughs> so yeah, so. shout out to Cheyenne there. Um, that's, that's so awesome. Cause she sees who you are. Yeah. And when, when I decided, cause like I've talked about it before, Overeaters Anonymous, I work the program in, in the 12 step program. It's like AA, but you know, for food addicts. Right. And realizing how much work needed to be done mentally and physically for me to change because I, I haven't talked about it a whole lot on the podcast, but I used to be a liar. I used to be a manipulator. Um, I just, I portrayed a good person, but inside I, w- I wasn't a good person. Right. And I told her when I first decided to make these changes, like it's going to be rough and I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it against you if you didn't want to be a part of this, if you wanted to leave. And I'm, I mean, again, that's probably me projecting, but, uh, she's like, no, we're, we're in it. So you can shut up about all that, <laughs> <laughs> man. That's, that's so awesome. I, uh, give your wife a high five for me. She doesn't, she doesn't know me from a bar of soap, but give her a high five anyways. Be like, you know, this guy thinks you're, you're, you're awesome. Uh, I'm very big on loyalty and I say now I'm very fiercely loyal to my wife, um, mm-hmm. because she stood by my side through all of my biggest and hardest struggles she wouldn't listen to me when i told her to leave she's like nope (laughs) uh you know she's she's like in my eyes she's this most amazing woman and i feel incredibly blessed to have her in my life you know and i wouldn't be here today doing this if i didn't have her refusing to give up on me yeah pushing you in her way you know that's awesome yeah i was gonna say well we kind of you know we kind of had to grow together and one of the things that really shifted for us is when I got to the place 
that I was comfortable telling her um, about my struggles and telling her emotionally where I was at and yeah. even saying, hey, you know what? When you say that, it actually hurts. Instead of just trying to sort of take it like a tough guy and yeah. be like, yeah, whatever, and shut down emotionally. You know, she used to call me the tin man. When I finally got to the place where I could say, hey, you know what? Like, it, it actually hurts when you when you put it that way. And I'd like it if you said that a little differently. It sounds like such a, I don't know, for a lot of people listening, again, they might just think it's a tiny thing, but for, for an emotional eating, like binge eating food addict to, and, and I felt a lot of shame around my struggles being a man. I thought it made me less of a man because of my struggles yep. to come to the place where I could say like that, that hurt. And I'd like you to, I'd like you to recognize that and maybe do things a little differently. So we kind of had to grow together and we, so we've had a rough patches too. That's, that's, it's great though, how it's, how it's turned out. And like you said, the, the man thing. Um, that's, that's a big one for me. You know, you're a man, don't show emotion. Don't be sad, you know, be a man. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like you said, uh, normalize therapy, normalize men's mental health. I think that's yes. a huge one because especially the people like I grew up around, like it was the same kind of upbringing bringing I had was you're a man. You don't, you don't cry. You don't, you're not sensitive. I think it's, it's a huge thing to, uh, put it out there and make it known that it's okay to uh, have these feelings that where we, it's okay to ask for help. Yeah, it is. It's okay to ask for help. That phrase in itself is like really powerful. And, you know, truthfully, like I'm an empath, but for a long time I ran from that. Yeah. Um, I was into powerlifting, raced motorcycles, uh, listened to heavy metal. Um, just this, we could almost call it like hyper masculine behavior because I don't know. I thought if the world actually saw that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a big guy, but I'm actually, I have a really gentle heart, a really caring heart. But I thought if people saw that, you know, the world would reject me. And, and thankfully it's not the case. Yeah. You're not, you're not a man if you're like that, you know? So I, yeah. that's how I was brought up, how I thought. Um, yeah. Like I've talked about it before. My, my, my dad was that old school, you know, I think he was born in 40, 44 something like that. So he was very old school and he, uh, yeah. no emotion at all. Like I, I seen him upset, like emotionally one time at a sister's funeral. Um, besides that, it was stone, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I can give my parents a lot of credit. Like, um, you know, I'd say they did the best they could with the tools they had. Um, yeah. they're still together 40, 42 years married, I think. Awesome. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's impressive. Um, so I was, I was fortunate in that regard. So sometimes I scratch my head and wonder where some of these things came from, but then you think about like even cultural conditioning, you know, I played sports, you know, yeah, tough, tough it out. Like don't, don't show emotion. You know, walk it um, off. Yeah. Yeah. Going back a little bit in our conversation, you brought up the, the brain driven weight loss. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit, like, I guess what, what do you, what do you mean when you say that brain driven weight loss? You know, yes, because, you know, you hear the eat less, move more. I'm like, yeah, like that'll influence. But really, it's actually our brain. And I think a lot of efforts to create change, to lose weight, for example, they take this outside in approach. And that's failing to acknowledge it's our internal environment, our emotions, our mindset, our psychology, our habits that really powerfully influence our behavior and ultimately our results. And actually, a lot of our actions take place at the subconscious or even unconscious level, um, partly because the brain forms habits. <laughs> you know, you repeat a behavior and your brain will form a habit. And so very often our behaviors are driven by like our habits, uh, our emotions, the, our, our beliefs, or even like our, our sense of identity. So if we want to create permanent weight loss, we, we have to actually create a permanent change. And we can only create a permanent change by establishing you know, a new pattern of behaviors, new habits, a new sense of identity. And this is all made possible because our brain has this neuroplasticity. It's really incredible. Yeah, the brain's ability to rewire itself. Yeah, so I, I had a, a guest on before and I, I believe that's what she was talking about. She said like, uh, picture it like a jungle and the paths that your brain is firing and not firing on is the clear paths. And it's, you know, eat junk food, don't go to the gym, you know, you're worthless. Well, you got to take your hatchet or your machete and chop down new paths. And it's mm -hmm. going to be, it's going to be rough, but it's, 
I believe that's the same. That's that's what she was talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I know we're coming up on time. I'm not sure how long we've been talking. <laughs> but <laughs> that's the sign of a good conversation. Yeah, it's it's really good. Uh, is there anything that you want to touch on that we uh, we didn't talk about? Um. Well, I mean, I could say like I think that weight loss is a doorway. It's not a destination. I really like that perspective because yes, weight loss is helpful. Absolutely. I think just about everybody who is overweight will benefit from losing weight, but I want people to recognize that it's not about a number on the scale. The number is really just a placeholder for a future that we think we'll be comfortable in, you know, where we feel comfortable in our skin. Uh, we wear clothes, we feel great. We don't get out of breath when we go on a hike, things like that. Yeah. You could say it's even like about freedom. So you can do an activity that you want to instead of one you wish. Your size doesn't preclude you from, you know, hey, sorry, you can't go bungee jumping or skydiving or ride the roller coaster or whatever. So weight loss does give us the opportunity to experience life more fully, but also happiness doesn't come from a number on the scale. Yeah. You mentioned three things, the roller coaster, bungee jumping and jumping and skydiving. Those are something that I want to do. I, yeah. I posted a picture. We went to a theme park recently and there was a sign that said, uh, may not be accommodating for our larger guest. And I was like, oh man. Those I'm trying words. to say it politely, but yeah. 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 And that's, that's one it's on my, uh, I have a goal list of everything that I want to do and fit on a roller coaster is one of them. Yeah. And you think about, um, like airplane seats, like we've mm. traveled a lot, my wife and I, we've been to like 45 countries on five continents and, oh, wow. um, man, airplane seats are uncomfortable, yeah. but sometimes it's normal things like cutting my toenails or wiping my butt, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. stuff you don't think about tying up shoes, yep. putting on socks, you know, taking that deep breath and then going down, holding on your breath. So you, before your gut cuts off your, uh, your breath. <laughs> I know exactly how it yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. So, and maybe I could just say like, so, it, cause I coach people obviously. Um, and I run a program called lifestyle 180 and it's a 180 day program. Why this program I think even came about is because most sort of weight loss programs, they involve like forcing someone to basically a straight jacket. There's usually judgment, shame, coercion, that kind of thing, because people don't understand behavior change. And so I wanted to create a program that was, yes, we'll, we'll connect the science of metabolism because that matters, but with the psychology of behavior change, and most importantly, the compassion of human connection. And I think it's really important that, that like in my mind, that we empower people. So you're not following my rules that I tell you to do. We work with a principle and we shape that. This is how this works for you. It's almost like, it's like two experts collaborating towards a common goal because you are the expert of your own life experience you're the expert of your body. And then I'll bring in my expert, you know, my expertise with nutrition and change psychology. And so I think it's a lot more empowering to take an approach like that than to say, you just have to follow my rules. Yeah. No, oh, that's great. So if anybody wanted to find out more about you or any of that, how would they reach out to you? Well, I'd love to say that I'm world famous, but we haven't quite got there yet. <laughs> on um, the way. Yeah, on the way. Uh, freedomnutritioncoach.com. Uh, that's my, my website. Uh, I, I run a podcast, uh, and I'm, I'm probably going to be inviting you onto that podcast because I love your story. Um, love it's it. called we Wellness Unplugged. So if you go to freedomnutrition.rocks slash wellnessunplugged, you'll find that. And maybe I could also give your listeners a free resource. Uh, freedomnutrition.rocks slash crush your cravings. So it's just a short guide that'll give you practical, practical, actionable steps on how to deal with emotional eating. And so uh, you're welcome to sign up, you know, get a copy of that. And oh, I'll spam awesome. that. I'll spam the heck out of your inbox, except I won't actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Yeah. I, and all your information, I'm going to link up in the show notes. So yeah, uh, your podcast website, all that, just so it's easier for people to find you. Yeah, man. Anything else before we get to your guest recommendation? No, you know, that I like to keep it simple, man. It's like, I'd love to have people tune into the podcast. I want to, where I say wellness unplugged is, is about between the before and after. 
it's uh, we're we're getting rid of the sort of the fake glitz, and we're we're talking about the real human experience, kind of like what you're doing here, you know. Yeah. And so I'm I'm really excited about it. Yeah, it's great. And you you said you just your your podcast you just re launched it yeah yeah i did solo episodes prior to that and so um there, there's now episodes up and published but it's relatively new on the podcast scene that's great man i well you got a follower here so as soon as we're Not done right here, on, i'm man. gonna go follow them all <laughs> yeah as for a guest recommendation what do you what do you recommend our listeners it doesn't have to be on topic it can be off topic you can have multiple things so if you want to say something on topic something off topic whatever what do you recommend? Ah, oh. well, here's something interesting. It's called Joya Toes. <laughs> and it's like, I think it's a Canadian thing. Um, you can, I mean, there's other versions of it, but this is little silicone toe dividers. And you think like, what the heck does this have to do with anything? Um, but like I developed bunions and like a hammer toe where my big toe like points inward. And mm-hmm. so these these Joya toes actually help to like I have a six month old and and when I watch him like flex his toes like naturally his feet can spread out, right? But our feet our toes get used to sort of being like bunched in, mm-hmm. and that creates a lot of pain, especially when you're overweight. So teaching my toes to like spread out again and distribute the weight more evenly like makes a huge difference. So that uh, yeah, they're called J O. I think it's J O Y Y A. Is that like, like the the nail oh. when when you get your oh. nails done? Is yeah, probably. Except they're they're probably a little tougher, like a little more robust. But yeah, J O Y A, Joya Toes. They're and I think they're a Canadian company, so maybe I'm giving a shout out to a Canadian one. <laughs> um, I, I think they're they're like my latest latest thing. And uh, maybe the other thing is like hug someone every day for like 20 seconds or more, uh, where you're not distracted by anything else. Um, you know, my wife and I implemented this. But like, just give someone a genuine hug every day, and feel that sense of human connection. Uh, it 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 just does one. It just does wonders for your mental health. You know, that's awesome. I love that. Yeah. So, I'm gonna add that to my list. Well, I, thank you for coming on. I had a really good time. Um, I know we could keep going. I I say this with every guest, but uh, I really want to have you back. <laughs> I mean, I I, I mean yeah. it to everybody, but. I think uh, the way we, yeah, our conversation went, like I said, it, we went to an hour. Um, <laughs> yeah, didn't man. Even, didn't even seem like 20 minutes. We're going to, we're going to, you're going to come on Wellness Unplugged and we'll keep that conversation going as well, man. Because uh, I think your, your willingness to share your story is in itself inspiring. So I'm, I'm excited about bringing you on as a guest as well. well. I can't wait to be on it, man. Thanks for coming on here and uh, yeah, I'll catch you later. John, thank you so much for coming on. I had a great time talking with you. It was just, it was a good time chatting with you. It's like I, I've known you for years. For those of you that want that free ebook that he had mentioned, I will post the link in the description of this episode so it's easy for you to find it. Also on Instagram, Freedom Nutrition Coach, and I will post the links to his podcast, Wellness Unplugged, as well. So you got everything going right there. Again, thank you so much. If you enjoyed this episode, please go over to Apple Podcast and leave me a rating and a review. It would mean the world to me. Also, if you could share this episode, if you know somebody that could benefit from it, or if you know somebody that would make a good guest on the show, send it to them and tell them to get a hold of me. I would love to have a conversation with them. Again, my website is www.lukeloosespodcast.com. Or you can call the loser line, which is 323-920-LUKE or 5853. Leave me a message. Tell me hello. Say whatever's on your mind. The music that you're listening to right now is by Jake Simmons and the Little Ghosts. Check them out. I will post the link to all their locations in the description of this episode. So, as always, that is that. Stay positive. Do the work. Trust the process, and I will see you next week.